قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين. So we return back to our class and start the sixth session with the sixth Imam whom Imam Ibn Abi Hatim al-Razi has mentioned in this book Taqdimatul Al-Marifa Bi Kitab Al-Jarwa Ta'adil and he is the Imam of the region of Asham, Imam Al-Awza'i Imam Al-Awza'i We travel from Al-Hijaz, from Medina, Imam Malik to Mecca, Imam Sufyan bin Uyena then to Iraq, the city of Kufa, Imam Sufyan al-Thawri then to the city of Basra Imam Shu'ba ibn al-Hajjaj and Hamad ibn Zaid. Now we move on to another major center for the studies of hadith in the times of the Atba'u Tabi'een, the area of Sham, which is presently divided into several countries of Syria and Lebanon and Palestine and other than them. The Imam of this area in the time of the Atba'u Tabi'een was Imam Al-Awza'i. Imam Al-Awza'i. So we begin with the biography of this great Imam by mentioning his name and lineage, he is Abu Amr. Abu Amr, his kunya is Abu Amr. Abdul Rahman ibn Amr. Abdul Rahman ibn Amr ibn Yuhmid. Ibn Yuhmid. Ashami al Awza'i. Ashami al Awza'i. And al Awza'i, this is an inscription to the area of al Awza'i to an area which was known as Al-Awza' that was around a, a door of the city of Syria called Bab Al-Faradis. Bab Al-Faradis. In the past times, every city, it had a boundary. It had a boundary and various doors to exit the city, enter and exit the city. Every city, it had a boundary around it and there were doors to exit and enter the city. And these doors, in most times, they had specific names and they were well known in the books of history one can refer back to and you will find the names of the doors that encircled and encompassed a city. So from the doors of the city of, si of Dimishq, of, of Damascus, the capital of Syria, the capital of Syria, Damascus, one of the doors was named Al-Faradis, Al-Faradis. And this door, or part of it, it still exists today, and it is known as Bab Al-Imara. Al-Imara, its name is well known amongst the people of Damascus as Al-Imara. So, the area of al awza was an area around this door, around this door and this door and area falls to the north of the great mosque al Jami al umawi al Jami al umawi the great central mosque of the city of damascus in syria that was built by al walid ibn abdul malik ibn marwan al walid ibn abdul malik ibn marwan and this mosque was known as one of the most famous Mosque of Islam, it was the seat of the Umayyad Caliphate. It was the seat of the Umayyad Caliphate that was in Damascus in Syria from the time of Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan radiallahu anhuma until it uh, dissolved, giving way to the Abbasid Caliphate. Giving way to the Abbasid Caliphate, it is one of the well known, famous mas masjids, mosque of Islam. Al Jami Al Umawi, the Umawi Grand Mosque, the Umawi Grand Mosque. So the, this area of Al Awza lied to the north of this great mosque where Imam Al Awza was born. Imam Al Awza was born in this area in Damascus, Syria. In Damascus, Syria. Then he moved to the city of Beirut, which is present day the capital of the country of Lebanon the capital of Lebanon. So he moved to Beirut and he took up residence in Beirut until he passed away in the city of Beirut. Imam al-Awza'i, he is Sheikh al-Islam. 
the scholars have unanimously called him with this great label that only very few scholars of Islam have received. Sheikh al Islam, the scholar of Islam, Alim Ahl al Sham, the scholar of the region of Sham, this great region, vast region. He was the foremost of the scholars of Sham in the time of the Atbaw Tabi'in. He's from the major students of the Tabi'in, from the major Atbaw Tabi'in. As far as his birth, then he was born in the year 88 after the Hijrah. He was born in the year 88 after the Hijrah. He says regarding his birth or estimation of his birth, he says, Kuntu muhtaliman aw shabihan bil muhtalim fi khilafati Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Fi khilafat Umar bin Abdul Aziz. He says that when Umar bin Abdul Aziz, the righteous caliphate of the Umayyad dynasty, who we just mentioned in the biography of Hamad ibn Zaid, he said when he reached into power and he became the caliph of the Muslims in the year 99 after the Hijrah, as we mentioned. 99 after the Hijrah, I had reached puberty or I was close to reaching puberty. So as we said, he was born in 88 after the Hijrah. Omar bin Abdul Aziz became the caliph in 99. So he was around 11, 12 years of age when Omar bin Abdul Aziz became the caliph of the Muslims. As far as his teachers, and his shiyukh, who he studied from and received and learned a hadith of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ from, then they are from the major scholars of hadith from the tabi'een and the atba'u tabi'een, such as Imam Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, Imam Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, and al-A'mash, Imam Suleiman Ibn Mihran al-A'mash, and Qatada, Qatada Ibn Di'ama al-Sadusi, and Ata bin Abi Rabah, and Nafi', Nafi', Mawla ibn Umar, the freed slave of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, and Muhammad ibn Sirin, and Yahya ibn Abi Kathir, and other than them, from the great Imams of the Tabi'een. These are the teachers of this great Imam, Imam al awzai Al-Zuhri, Al-Amash, Qatada, Ata bin Abi Rabah, Nafi', Muhammad ibn Sirin, Yahya ibn Abi Kathir, and other than them. From his Foremost students are Imam Malik and Shu'bah, Shu'bah ibn al-Hajjaj and Imam al-Thawri, the three Imams that we just covered. They are all from his contemporaries. They all lived in the same time. But due to the great status and stature of Imam al awzai and the precision and, and authority he reached in the science of Hadith, they sought knowledge of hadith from him and they related and narrated a hadith on his authority. So Imam Malik, Imam Shurba and Imam Thawri from his contemporaries, from his companions were his students also who narrated a hadith on him. From his students are Al-Walid ibn Muslim. Al-Walid ibn Muslim. He was from the foremost of his students and we will find his name a lot in the coming minutes. He has narrated a lot of incidents, life instances and statements of his teacher Imam al awzai he was from the area of Sham and he, he lived and traveled and learned hadith from Imam al awzai for a long period of time, Al-Walid ibn Muslim. From his students is Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak and Abdul Razzaq al-San'ani, the author of the well-known book Musannaf Abdul Razzaq and Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan and Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Firyabi and other than them from the great scholars of hadith. These are all students of Imam al awzai Walid ibn Muslim, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Abdul Razak al-San'ani, Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan, Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Firyabi and other than them. Then we move on to the statements of the scholars of Islam regarding this great Imam, Imam al awzai and the scholars of Hadith regarding his high stature and his authority in the field of Hadith and his sciences. From that is that Imam Ismail ibn Ayyash, Rahimullah, he says, سمعت الناس يقولون في سنة أربعين ومية الأوزاعي هو عالم الأمة that I heard he says I heard the people the Muslims unanimously saying in the year 140 after the Hijrah 140 after the Hijrah we will soon see that Imam al-Awzai he passed away in the year 157 157 so this was 17 years before his death 17 years before his death he had reached the pinnacle in the sciences of hadith and become well known in the Islamic nation, in the Ummah to the point that he said, I heard the Muslims unanimously saying in the year 140 
70 years before his death, that uh, Imam al awzai he is the scholar of the entire Muslim nation. He's the scholar of the Islamic Ummah. Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, rahimahullah, he says, Kan al awzai Imam Ahli Zamani. That Imam al awzai he was unquestionably the undisputed Imam of the people of his times. The Imams of the people of his times. Imam al khurebi rahimahullah, he says, Kan al awzai Afdal Ahli Zamani. That Imam al awzai was the best of the people of his times. The best of the Muslims of his time was his great Imam, Imam al awzai And we have repeatedly mentioned the statement of Imam Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, Rahimahullah, that Aymatun Nas fi Zamanihim Arba, that the Imams of the Muslims in their areas in the time of the Atbaw Tabi'een are four Sufyan al Thawri bil Makkah, bil, bil Kufa, wa Malikun bil Hijaz, wa Lawzai bil Sham, wa Hamad bin Zayd bil Basra. That Sufyan al-Thawri in the area of Kufa, Malik in the area of Hijaz, and Awza'i in the area of Sham, and Hamad ibn Zayd in the area of Basra. Imam Muhammad ibn Sa'ad, rahimahullah, he says, regarding Imam al-Awza'i, وَكَانَ ثِقَةً مَأْمُونًا صَدُوقًا فَاضِلًا خَيِّرًا كَثِيرًا الْحَدِيثُ وَالْعِلْمُ وَالْفِقْحُ حُجَّةً That he was thiqa, he was the most utmost reliable narrator of hadith. And he was Mamun. He is to be trusted in his narration of hadith upon the authority of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu He was truthful. He was noble. He was the best of people. Kathirul hadith wal ilm al fiqh. He had a vast quantity of hadith that he had strove and exerted and collected and compiled and memorized and preserved. And knowledge and fiqh. We will soon find out that he is just not an imam in the field of hadith and his sciences. Rather, he was from the great jurists of this nation. He is from the foremost fuqaha of this, of this ummah. And he had positions and statements and fatawa that the people followed. And the people, they, he had a madhab, a methodology, a school of thought that was present for a long period of time in several countries before it died off before it died off and we'll talk about this in detail when the time comes inshallah and he closes off his statement Imam Muhammad Saad by saying Hujja that he's a proof over the people he's a proof for the people of Islam then we move on to our topic of mentioning some life instances from the biography of this great Imam that show or that we can ponder and reflect upon and benefit from Walid ibn Muslim, as we just mentioned, his name will come a lot from the foremost students of Imam al awzai Walid ibn Muslim al Dimashqi, who resided and lived in the city of Damascus in Syria. He says, "Ma ra'aytu ahadan ashadda ishtihadan min al awzai fil ibada." That I have never seen anyone who was more, who exerted himself more in worship of Allah Azza wa Jal than Imam al awzai I, never, I have seen no one who exerted more, himself more in worship of Allah than Imam al awzai Other scholars have mentioned, Hajja, fama nama ala rahila inna ma huwa fi salah. That Imam al awzai he made Hajj. He made the pilgrimage of Hajj. So, in this journey for Hajj, we did not see him resting and reclining and sleeping on his riding uh, animal or the mode of transportation that they used in those times rather we saw him in a state of prayer and salah in a prayer of prayer and salah as we all know from the rulings of islam regarding the salah is that it is permissible for a person to pray the rawatib the sunan the the the, the, the prayers that are voluntary that are not obligatory other than the five obligatory prayers, it is permissible for a person to pray it on a riding animal or a mode of transportation. Today we can pray it in our cars, on the ships, on the planes, etc. As authentic hadith have come regarding this matter in the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Imam al Zayf put this into action and this shows his devotion to worship that he would not waste his time even in those tiring journeys he would be busy in praying Salah on his 
uh, riding animal and mode of transportation. Abu Mus'har, Imam Abu Mus'har rahimullah, he says, Inna ummahu kanat tadkhul manzil al-awza'i wa tatafaqqad mawda musallah fa tajiduhu ratban min dumu'ihi fis layl that his mother, she used to enter his residence, his residence in the morning. And when she would reach the place where he would pray the night prayers, his musalla, where he would, the, the room or the area in his house where he would take as a place to pray the qiyamul layl, the night prayers, he would find, she would find this place wet with his tears. She would find this place moist and wet due to the tears that he would cry in Qiyamul Layl. The scholars have mentioned that ما رؤي الأوزاعي ضاحكا مقحقها قط ولكن كان يعز الناس فلا يبقى أحد في مجلسه إلا بكى بعينه أو بقلبه وما رأيناه يبكي في مجلسه قط The scholars have mentioned that we never saw Imam Al-Awzai hysterically laughing laughing hysterically and we never saw him crying in front of the people. We never saw him crying in his gatherings. He used to advise the people and admonish them. He was from the great Wa'az, those people who admonished the people and advised them and, uh, and directed them as we'll find soon his great stories regarding this. They, he used to advise the people and admonish them so no one would be left in his gathering except that he would cry. He would cry except by way of his eyes or internally his heart would tremble. His heart would tremble and cry. But we never saw himself crying. We never saw himself crying. But if he were to enter his house, his residence, when he was away from the view of the people, then he would cry in his worship, in his Qiyamul Layl, in his night prayers, until people would have someone would have mercy upon him, the one who would see him. If anyone would see him in the state, they would have mercy upon him. This shows that these great Imams and the worship that they did and acts of obedience, they were solely for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. They were not for the view, views of the people and the eyes of the people. Today, we see that the people in their worships, when they are not in front of the people, they are lax in it. They do not exert themselves. But when they're in front of the people, they beautify their worship. They cry and they yell and they, they, they take pictures and videos and it's all something for views and clicks and shows and eyes of the people. These great Imams, they were the opposite. They, they hid the, the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal and their obedience and worship to Him from the people. And they used to worship Allah Azza wa Jal in privacy, doing it solely for His sake alone. Ahmad ibn Abil Hawari, rahimullah, he says, Balagani anna nasraniyan ahda ila lawza'i jarrat asal. That it, it, it was narrated to me that one of the Nasara, one of the Christians, as we all know, that the area of Sham, since past early times until today, the area of Sham, such as Syria and Damascus, and other than them, they have always had the people of the book. Ahlul Kitab, the Jews and the Christians residing in these lands. So he said that it is narrated to me that one of the Christians, he gifted Imam al a a pot of honey. A pot of honey. فَقَالَ يَا أَبَا عَمْرُ تَكْتُبْ لِي إِلَى وَالِي بَعْلَ بَكْ He gifted him this pot of honey in the hopes, desiring that Imam al would write regarding some problem of his to the governor of the area of Balabak. It is an area that was well known in that times, a, a, a name of a city, that he would write to solve this problem of his. And as we'll see, Imam al Uzai, he had a great position and, and fear near the rulers of, uh, and governors of Islam at that time. They all feared him and, and they revered him and respected him. So he presented this jar of honey as a way to bribe him or uh, entice him to write to the governor of this area to solve his problem. So look at the piety of this great Imam and his position. He says, 
إن شئت رددت الجرة وكتبت لك وإلا قبلت الجرة ولم أكتب لك. That the choice is yours. He told the Nasrani, the Christian, if you want, then I can return this jar of honey to you, and I will write to the governor to solve your problem. And if you want, then I will accept this present, this jar of honey from you, but I will not write to the governor. Then I will not write to the governor. Meaning that they did all of this solely for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. They, they did not take bribes. They were not enticed by worldly matters and gifts and possessions. If they wanted to help somebody, they would do it solely for the sake of Allah, without accepting any presents and gifts for that sake. So he said, either I'll accept this gift from you, but I'll not write. And if I were to write, I will not accept this gift, I'll return it for you, to you. So, فَرَدَّ الْجَرَّ وَكَتَبَ لَهُ So, he returned the jar of honey, then he wrote to the governor to solve the problem of this, of this person. Then we move on to the creed, the aqidah, the i'tiqad of this great imam and his belief system and his position regarding innovations and the people of innovations and misguidance. And Imam al awzai from the six Imams or the five Imams that have come from us, his positions and his statements regarding following the Sunnah and the methodology of the Salaf in Creed and sticking firm to it and opposing the people of innovation and shunning them and refuting them and disparaging them and mentioning the evils of all types of misguidance and innovations, they are uh, in such big numbers that they cannot be enumerated. We have just brought you some examples, some examples that show the great uh, creed, the pure creed of this great Imam and how a Muslim should deal with innovations and misguidance and the people of innovation. His positions are countless and every position of his and statement is, is a, is a uh, chance for us to ponder and reflect and one should just refer back to his biography to find these positions and statements we just brought some of them and this is why this will be the longest point of discussion in this biography the longest point and the most point time will spread in this biography is discussing the creed of this great imam and his position regarding innovations and the people of innovation so we start off by saying that Imam al awzai he has said, "Isbir nafsaka ala sunna, wa qif haythu wa qaf al qawm, wa qul fi ma qalu, wa kuf amma kafu, wa sluk sabila salafika salih, fa innahu yasaaka ma yasaahum." He says that be steadfast upon the sunna of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Be patient upon it. And stop where the scholars of the Salaf before us stopped. Do not go ahead. Do not surpass where, where they stopped. Stop where they stopped. And say with what they have said. Believe in your matters of creed and matters of belief. Say what they have said in agreement to what they have said. And Stay silent and quiet about what they have not said. Stay silent. Do not speak about matters that they have not spoken about. The Salaf, those who have passed. Was look sabil salafika salih. And follow the path of your Salaf salih, the righteous predecessors, those who came before us. Fainnahu yasa'at ma yasa'ahum. For verily, that path that they treaded upon, if it was enough for them, then it is enough for you. It is enough for you. You do not need to surpass them and to say that and dwell into matters that they did not dwell in. Stop where they stop. Say with what that they said. Stay steadfast and upon the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and be patient upon it. Imam Al Awzai, rahimahullah, he says, "Mabtada rajulun bid'atan illa suliba al wara." That no person innovates. A innovation in the religion of Islam except that Allah wa removes piety and obedience 
from his heart. Allah Ta'ala removes piety and obedience from his heart. Mubashir ibn Ismail al-Hubuli, rahimullah, he says, Qila lil awza'i, inna rajulan yaqul, ana ujalisu ahla sunnah wa ujalisu ahla al-bidah. This is a great st statement and position for us to ponder upon. It's, it was said to Imam al-Awza'i that a person claims and he says that I sit and accompany the people of the Sunnah, the Ahlul Sunnah, the people who are upon the creed and methodology of the Salaf, who are the safe sect and the aided group, who are upon righteous, who are upon the right path. I sit with them, accompany them, seek knowledge from them, learn from them, and I also sit and accompany with the people of innovation and misguidance. I sit with both of them. I sit with both of them. I accompany both of them. I seek knowledge from both of them. I take the good, I leave the bad. So Imam Al-Awza'i, this great Imam of the Salaf, he says, the great Imam of the Atbaw Tabi'in, فَقَالَ الْأَوْزَعِي هَذَا رَجُلٌ يُرِيدُ أَنْ يُسَاوِي بَيْنَ الْحَقْ وَالْبَاطِلِ that this is a person who deems to make the truth and the falsehood the same. He wants and he tries, he is trying to make the truth and the falsehood the same. The person who seeks knowledge and sits and accompanies the people of righteous, of uh, people who are truth on the truth and people who are on falsehood, the one who does that, he, according to Imam al awzai is someone who is trying to unite and he is trying to make the truth equal to falsehood equal to falsehood imam ibn batta al uqbari ibn batta al uqbari he has a great book al ibanatul kubra al ibanatul kubra in which he has collected the creed of the salaf these great imams and other than them by way of his chain of narrations by way of his chain of narrations he he passed away in the year 387 after the hijra 307 is a well-known book This is published and amongst us today alhamdulillah if one were to refer or research the, the positions and statements of the great imams regarding creed then upon him is to refer to this book al-ibanatul kubra al-ibanatul kubra he says after narrating this statement of imam al-awzai with his authentic chain he says sadaq al-awzai verily imam al-awzai has spoken the truth aqulu then he says Inna haza rajulun la yarifu al-haqq min al-batil wala al-kufra min al-iman wa fi misli haza nasal al-Qur'an wa waradat al-sunnatu an al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam There's a person who does this, who sits and accompanies the people of sunnah and the people of innovation, then he does not know truth from falsehood. He cannot differentiate between truth and falsehood. And he will not be able to differentiate between kufr, between disbelief and iman and belief. And regarding him, Allah wa ta revealed the ayat in the Quran and the Sunnah, the Prophet has mentioned a hadith in his Sunnah. What is this ayah? Imam Ibn Batta, he says, قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى وَإِذَا لَقُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا وَإِذَا دَخَلَوا إِلَى شَيَاطِينِهِمْ قَالُوا إِنَّا مَعَكُمْ That this ayah pretends to these people who accompany and sit and seek knowledge and learn from both the Ahlul Sunnah and Ahlul Bidah, the people of Sunnah and people of innovation, that Allah Ta'ala says that if they were to meet the people who believe, they will say, we are with you. We are with you. But if they, if they leave them to the shayateen, the, the misguided, then they will say that we are with you. Then we are with you. Imam Al-Awza'i, Rahimullah, he says, Man waqqara sahib bid'a faqad aana ala mufaraqat al-Islam wa man waqqara sahib bid'a faqad aarad al-Islam birad that whoever honors and respects and reveres an innovator then he has aided in the destruction of Islam and he has aided in people leaving the fold of Islam and the one who has honored and revered and respected a person, a, a person of innovation, an innovator, then he has opposed Islam and has refused it. He has opposed Islam and he has refused it. Imam al awzai rahimahullah also says, إِذَا ظَهَرَتِ الْبِدْعَ فَلَمْ يُنْكِرْهَا أَهْلُ الْعِلْمِ سَارَتْ سُنَّةِ That 
if innovation appears, any act of innovation appears, and the people of knowledge, the people of Sunnah, if they are not to rebuke and refute this innovation, then after a while, the general folks, the general layman Muslim, will believe it to be a Sunnah, will believe it to be a Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad And this is what we see in our times when people, innovations are created and brought to light, and the people who have knowledge, they remain silent. They do not rebuke and criticize and refute these innovations. After a while, thousands and millions of people start, start following this innovation, thinking that it is part of the religion of Islam, thinking that it is a sunnah of Prophet Muhammad This shows the great responsibility upon the people of knowledge, the people who have knowledge that this is an innovation to speak and to refute and to rebuke innovations. No matter what the people say, no matter what hardships they face in this way. Imam al awzai rahimullah, he says, Man satara anna bid'atahu lam tukhfi alayna ulfatuhu. That whoever tries and is able to hide from us his innovation, if he's an innovator on a path of innovation, then even if he hides from us this innovation, and he apparently he shows to us that he's on the right path upon the sunnah, but he will not be able to hide from us those people he loves and those people he accompanies and sits. This was a criteria and a way that all of the Imams of the Salaf, including the Imam al awzai they utilized to differentiate the people of the Sunnah from the people of innovation and to identify them that the one who accompanies and he sits in the gatherings of the people of innovation, then he is from them, then he is from them. The person of Sunnah, he safeguards his religion. He does not mix and he does not go to the gatherings of the innovators and does not make his religion suspect to trials and tribulations and misguidance. Imam al awzai rahimahullah, he says that Qala Iblis li awliyaihi min ayna ta'atun bani Adam faqalu min kulli bab qala fahal ta'atunahum min qibl al-istighfar that he said that Iblis, he told his followers and his, those people who aid him from the shayateen of the jinn and the ins and the humans. He asked them that how will you misguide humankind and the worshippers of Allah Azza wa Jal. So they told him that we will misguide them from all angles, from every angle. So he asked them, will you try to misguide them from the angle of istighfar, seeking forgiveness from Allah Azza wa Jal? So they said, they told the Iblis that this is, that is something that we are not able to do. We cannot misguide a servant of Allah from the angle of istighfar, seeking, ref, uh, seeking refuge, seeking forgiveness of Allah, because istighfar is part of tawheed, of believing in Allah Azza wa Jal, to seek to him, to refer to him, to repent to him is part of tawheed. Qala, la atiyannahum min babin la yastaghfirun Allahu minhu, fabassa fihim al ahwa wal bid'ah. So he said, verily, we will come to them from angles that are far away from istighfar that are far away from seeking repentance from Allah. So he sent amongst the people innovations and misguidance. He sent amongst the people innovations and misguidance. Because a person of innovation, <coughs> an innovator, he does not seek the forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal upon this innovation. Because he deems that what he's doing is obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal. It's something that is bringing him close to Allah Azza wa Jal. Something that he's worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by way of. So, he's the farthest of the people from seeking, from seeking forgiveness of Allah. We will find the positions of this great Imam, Imam al awzai regarding some of the well-known people of innovation and deviance and the misguided sects and groups that existed in his time and that exist amongst us today that we are to learn from and ponder upon and reflect. Regarding the Sufi, the Sufis, Imam Walid ibn Muslim, rahimullah, he says that Rayatul Awza'i, 
yasbutu fi musallahu yaskurullah hatta tatlu ash-shams wa yukhbiruna 'an as-salaf anna zalika kana hadyuhum fa idha tal'at ash-shams qama ba'dhum ila ba'd fa afadu fi dhikrillah wa tafaqqahu fi dini that he says walidun muslim that i saw imam al-awza'i that if he were to pray the fajr prayer in the masjid the fajr prayer in the masjid then he would sit after the prayer in his place making the remembrance of allah making zikr making the remembrance of allah until the sun would come out until the sun would come out and he would say that this was the guidance and practice of the salaf the salaf the righteous predecessors before us and if the sun would come out then he would leave the masjid he would leave the zikr and then the scholars would gather and they would talk about the quran the ayat of allah and they would seek tafaqqu in his religion jurisprudence and understanding regarding regarding matters of the religion by of seek by way of seeking the hadith of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam because jurisprudence and understanding in the religion is gained by way of the hadith of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this is a refutation of the sufis those who have innovated various practices of making zikr in groups and in 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 circles where they gather and have various ways that they make zikr and uh, they repeat it and they have specific times for making the, the holding these gatherings for zikr in this is a refutation of these innovations and showing how the guidance of the salaf the righteous predecessors was regarding this action we come to the rafid shia sect that existed in his times and that exists in our time baqi ibn al baqiya ibn al walid rahimullah he says qala lil awza'i ya baqiya la tazkur ahadan min ashabi nabiyyik sallallahu alaihi wasallam illa bi khair that baqiya ibn al walid he says my teacher and sheikh imam al awza'i he advised me by saying oh baqiya do not mention anyone from the companions of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam except with goodness except by revering him and honoring him and respecting him and praising him ya baqiya al ilmu ma ja'a an ashabi muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ma lam yaji anhum fa laysa bi ilm that oh baqiya knowledge is that which has come on the authority of the companions of prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that which has not come from them then it is not knowledge that which is not from them that is that which is not narrated from them that the their understanding of the religion if someone deviates and differs from this then that is not knowledge then that is not knowledge this reminds us of the great saying that imam ibn al qayyim rahimullah he narrated upon one of the scholars of the salaf that he said this two lines of poetry prose he says that al ilmu qala allah qala rasuluh qala as sahabatu laysa bi tamwihi that knowledge is what is proper knowledge qala allah what allah ta'ala has said in the quran and qala rasuluh what rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said in the sunnah qala as sahaba and what the sahaba have said and implemented and understood of the quran and the sunnah laysa bi tamwihi ilm knowledge is not that which is other than it that which has falsehood and truth in it quran and the sunnah upon the understanding of the salaf upon the understanding of the sahaba is the only thing that is truth everything after it is just some that which has truth and falsehood mixed in it then he said the second line of poetry mal ilmu nasbuka lil khilaf safahatan bayna ar rasul wa bayna ar ra'yi faqihi that knowledge is not for you to create a difference of opinion between the hadith of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the position and the fatwa and a statement of a scholar from the scholars of this umma and this is ignorance this is safaha this is not knowledge this is ignorance as we see today the blind followers of the four madhahib and the extremists and the uh, and the fanatics of these four madhahib and the imams of this four madhahib if one were to present the hadith of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam they were rejected by saying but my imam has said such and such 
my imam has said such and such uh, as if the statement of an imam is a difference of opinion with the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This great scholar that Imam Ibn Qayyim quotes says, this is not knowledge, rather this is ignorance. This is ignorance. Imam al-Awza'i, rahimahullah, he says also regarding the Rafid al-Shia, لا يجتمع حب علي وعثمان رضي الله عنهما إلا في قلب مؤمن that the love and honor and respect and reverence of Ali bin Abi Talib and Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhuma does not combine except in the heart of a believer except in the heart of a believer only the true believer is the one who loves and reveres and respects and honors both Ali and Uthman both Uthman and Ali unlike the Rafi the Shia who curse and rebuke and make takfir and deem the Sahaba other than Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhum to be disbelievers wal i'adhu billah then we move on to his position regarding those people who negate the attributes of Allah azza wa jal and distort their meanings from the jahmiyyah and other than them the misguided sects that dis distort the meanings of the sifat of Allah and that negate the meanings of these sifat and the ayat and the uh, ahadith that contain this attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. Imam al awzai he says regarding them, Kunna wa tabi'una mutawafirun naqulu inna Allah ta'ala fawqa arshi wa nu'minu bima waradat bihi as sunna min sifati. This is a great statement of this great imam. He says, we used to say openly without any criticism and any opposition and any refutation and rebuke when the tabi'een, my teachers, my scholars, the great, the tabi'een, they were present in large numbers. We used to say in front of them in the gatherings that Allah Azza wa Jal, He is above His Arsh, above the seven heavens. And none of them, not a single one of the tabi'een would oppose us, would rebuke us, would refute this or criticize us. They were all united on this creed that Allah Ta'ala is above the seven heavens upon his arsh as has come in the Quran and the Sunnah in several ayat and ahadith and he said we used to believe in other aspects of the attributes of Allah upon their apparent meanings as has come in the Sunnah and our scholars and teachers from the Tabi'een none of them would oppose us in this they were all united upon this belief Walid ibn Muslim rahimullah he says سألت الأوزاعي وسفيان بن عيينة ومالك بن عنس عن هذه الأحاديث في الصفات والرؤية فقالوا أمروها كما جاءت بلا كيف He says that I asked Imam al-Awza'i and Sufyan ibn Uyayna and Malik ibn Anas three of the greatest Imams of the Atwa Tabin in those times that they all were united on these matters of creed He said I asked them regarding the Ahadith that contain the attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal, the Sifat of Allah and that the believers we see Allah Azza wa Jal with their two eyes on the day of judgment and in paradise. Fakala Amiruha Kamajad Bila Kaif. All of them unanimously said, accept them, believe with them in their apparent meanings without asking how. Without asking Kaif. How will we see Allah Azza wa Jal? Without asking Kaif, believe in these uh, attributes and these ahadith in their apparent, apparent meanings. Then we move on to another major sect of misguidance and innovation that existed in that time and still exists today, the Murjia, the Murjia who claim that actions are not part of Iman and that actions do not increase and decrease. We mentioned the statement of Imam Abdul Razak al-Sanani in the biography of Imam Sufyan al-Thawri that he says, Sameetu Malikan wal awza'i wa ibn Juraj wa thawri wa ma'amaran yaqulun al-Imanu qawlun wa amalun yazidu wa yanqus. That he says, that this was the creed of, of all of these Imams, Imam Malik and Awza'i and Ibn Juraj and, and Sufyan al thawri and Ma'amar Ibn Rashid, all of them unanimously used to say that Iman is statements and actions. Iman is qawl and amal, statements and actions, and it increases and it decreases. And it increases and it decreases. Imam al Awza'i rahimahullah also has said, La yastaqeemu al Iman illa bil qawl. Wa la yastaqeemu al Iman wal qawl illa bil amal. وَلَا يَسْتَقِيمُ الْإِيمَانُ وَالْقَوْلَ الْعَمَلِ إِلَّا بِنِيَّةٍ مُوَافَقَ لِسُنَّةٍ وَكَانَ مَنْ مَضَى مِنْ سَلَفِنَا لَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بَيْنَ الْإِيمَانُ وَالْعَمَلِ وَالْعَمَلِ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ
wal imanu min al amal he says that iman is not correct and proper except by way of speech by way of statements and iman and statements are not proper except by way of actions and iman and statements and actions are not proper except by way of believing in the heart and intentions and the salaf he says kana min man mada min salafina the righteous predecessor who who came before us they used to not differentiate between iman and actions iman and actions were the same they could they did not differentiate between iman and actions wal amalu min al iman wal iman min al amal verily actions are from iman and iman is from actions and iman is from actions we will finish this this point of discussion as we said the statements of this great imam and his positions and his life events and stories regarding following the creed of the salaf and refuting the people of innovation and shunning them uh, they are innumerable one cannot enumerate them one has to refer back to his biography to read the great positions and to take benefit from them we'll just finish off by mentioning that imam al auzai we alluded to this that he was someone who even the rulers of islam at those time feared and revered and honored the 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 caliphs of that time and the governors of that time they had great honor and respect for him and he did not fear anybody in the path of allah azza wa jal he used to advise every one of them and they all referred back to him for matters of the religion and to matters that that concerned all of the muslims he was the leader of the muslims of that time the best of them the most noble of them and imam ibn abi hatim al razi in this great book taqdimat al ma'rifa he has mentioned the letters the messages that imam al auzai wrote to the rulers of that time to the governors and to the caliphate advising them to stick on to the sunna and holding steadfast to it advising them to oppose and refute and shun and punish the people of innovation and misguidance and to cut them off and to finish innovations and misguidance and various other great advices that he sent to the rulers of their times and these letters are are of several pages if one were to read them it will take several uh, sessions and all of them contain great benefits for us but we'll just mention one small letter that he sent to the greatest ruler of that time the true founder of the abbasid caliphate who was al abu jafar al mansur abu jafar al mansur who is the second caliphate of the abbasid dynasty but in reality he is the founder of this dynasty he is the founder the real founder of this dynasty he is the one who built the great city the capital of iraq baghdad baghdad darus salam which was the seat the center of the abbasid dynasty imam this leader of the muslims abu jafar al mansur wrote to a letter to imam al auzai asking advice from him of how to rule amongst the people what to rule uh, um, uh, them with he says that kataba al mansur ila al auzai فقال اما بعد فقد جعل امير المؤمنين في عنقك ما جعل الله لرعيته قبلك في عنقه فاكتب الي بما رايت فيه المصلحه مما احببت so the ruler of the muslims the caliphate mansur abu jafar mansur just wrote this one line to imam al auzai he said that verily Allah Azza wa Jal has placed a responsibility over the ruler of the Muslims Amirul Mu'minin to rule upon them by his law and by his religion so write to me with an advice regarding this matter with that which you, which you see is a benefit for all of the people all of the Muslims who are under my rule write to me with a benefit that you see is beneficial with for all of the muslims under my rule whatever you deem is whatever you you like and whatever you deem is beneficial so he said fa kataba ilay with this great advice he says fa kataba ilay amma ba'du fa alayka bi taqwa allah wa tawadu 
يرفعك الله يوم يدع المتكبرين في الأرض بغير الحق. He said, O oh, leader of the believers, O oh, Amir al Muminin, it is upon you to fear Allah Azza wa Jal, to have the taqwa of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and to be, and to have tawadu, and to be humble, and to have humbleness. Allah Taala will raise you. In, in degree on the day where he will lower those people who had pride in the, in the world, in the worldly life. On the, on the day of judgment, in the hereafter, Allah Ta'ala will raise you by way of this humbleness and he will lower those people who had pride in, in rulership. Those rulers who have pride over the people, Allah Ta'ala will lower their ranks on that day and in the hereafter. Then he continues, وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ قَرَابَتَكَ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم لَنْ تَزِيدَ حَقَّ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ إِلَّا عِذَمًا This great advice, he's advising the ruler of the Muslims, the caliphate who ruled the east and the west lands. He's saying, and remember, that your close relationship to Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, your lineage with him, because the Banu Abbas, the Abbasid Caliphate, they are from the offsprings of Al-Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib radiallahu anhu the uncle of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so he said remember that your lineage and proximity in, in relationship to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu sallam has made the right of Allah upon you even greater than anyone else because you are a close relative of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu sallam so your responsibility and duty to act upon the religion of Islam and the teachings of Islam and the Quran Sunnah is greater because of your proximity in lineage to him. Wala ta'atahu illa wujuban. And Allah Ta'ala, because of this proximity in lineage, He has made His obedience upon you to be obligatory. That you reflect and represent the family of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it is upon you and is befitting to you that you carry this responsibility with care. You, you, it is obligatory upon you to worship Allah Azza wa Jal and obey Him like your relative Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu did and taught. This is something that is a greater responsibility upon you because you represent this family. You represent the family of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is just a small letter that he wrote to the leader of the Muslims at that time and he has great letters that Imam Ibn Hatim al-Razi has mentioned in this book, Taqdim al narifa We'll finish off with this statement. Ibn Abi al-Ishreen, he says, سَمَيْتُ أَمِيرًا كَانَ بِالسَّاحِلْ يَقُولْ قَدْ وَقَدْ دَفَنَّا لَوْزَاعِي وَنَحْنُ عِنْدَ الْقَبَرِ That he says that I was in the gathering where we had just buried Imam al -Awzai. He had passed away. We had washed him, we had prayed over him, and we had just buried him. So one of the governors of the area of Sham, he had attended the gathering, his burial. He has attended his gathering. Look at the fear and the position of this great Imam due to his knowledge and piety that he had amongst the rulers of the Muslims at that time. So this governor started saying after they had buried him, Rahimakallah Aba Amr, Falakat Kuntu Akhafuka. أكثر ممن ولاني. He said, Oh Abu Amr, Abdul Rahman ibn Amr al Auzai, may Allah have mercy on you. Rarely I used to fear you more than the Caliphate who had who had appointed me as a governor. I used to fear you more than the Caliphate who appointed me as a governor, because had Imam al Auzai spoke, then the entire Muslim nation would lose the respect and honor for such a person. Such was the status and, and the level that these Imams reached in their knowledge and their piety and their, uh, and their uh, great status amongst the people and in the religion of Islam. And we will take a break here, inshallah, and continue after the break. If there are any questions, then uh, you can ask them, inshallah. Knowledge gatherings or just if, even if people have friends who are innovators, what do you mean by that? 
No, these are, these are gatherings where matters of the religion are discussed and are uh, taught and learned. As far as worldly gatherings, gatherings of selling and buying, it is permissible for one to deal with even the disbelievers, for the, with the non-Muslims. These, these statements and these positions are, are for a person to safeguard his religion so that his religion is not tested and trials, uh, tribulations do not enter it in his religion. As far as uh, gathering of in, in your workplace, on the streets, in the marketplace, then this is something that does not uh, pretend to this. That does not pretend to this. But rather, a person in these gatherings, in the marketplace and his work, on the streets, then he should call the people to the correct path, to the path of Islam, to the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Salaf, according to the knowledge that he possesses, according to the correct knowledge that he possesses, according to his ability, according to his ability. Now, we return back to our class where we were covering the biography of this great Imam of the Atba'u Tabi'een in the area of Asham, Imam Abu Amr, Abdurrahman ibn Amr al awzai Rahimahullah. After learning about his creed and belief system in which he's united with all of the Imams of the Salaf, in which he believed upon the Quran and the Sunnah, upon the understanding of the Salaf, the foremost being the Sahab and the Tabi'een, and other than them, and his position regarding the people of innovation and the people of misguidance and to shun them and to stay far away from them and to protect the religion from them. We move on to the next topic that we always discuss in these lectures, which is his methodology regarding jurisprudence and matters of worship and acts of obedience. Ittiba, his falling of the Sunnah Prophet Muhammad وسلم, unconditionally. Here we find that he is again united with the other great Imams of the Salaf that we have covered in our previous classes in unconditionally following the Sunnah and Hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and placing it above the statements and positions and fatawa and the rulings of anyone from the scholars and giving it precedence, giving Hadith precedence then over everyone else. From that is the statement of Imam al awzai he says, عَلَيْكَ بِآثَارِ مَنْ سَلَفْ وَإِنْ رَفَضَكَ النَّاسِ وَإِيَّاكَ وَآرَى الرِّجَالِ وَإِنْ زَخْرَفُوهُ لَكَ بِالْقَوْلِ فَإِنَّ الْأَمَرِ يَنْجَلِي وَأَنْتَ عَلَى سِرَاتٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ He says that it is obligatory upon you, O Muslim, O believer, to follow the path of the Salaf, of the pious predecessors, those who have passed before you. وَإِنْ رَفَضَكَ النَّاسِ Even if all of the people were to abandon you and shun you. Even if all of the people of your area, of your time, were to abandon and shun you and oppose you for you falling the way and path of the Salaf, then it is upon you to remain steadfast upon this path. وَإِيَّاكَ وَعَرَى rijal And beware of following the opinions and the positions and the fatawa and the statements of men and scholars of this Ummah. Uh, even if they were to beautify it by way of their speech, even if they were to beautify it by way of the speech, if they are in opposition to the Sunnah of Hadith Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and understanding of the Salaf, for verily you ought to remain upon this path even if you are alone and, uh, until this strangeness that you are in, this soulness that you are in, it is removed by Allah Azza wa Jal and you find more people who follow you and who are with you upon this path and you are upon the right, you continue upon this right path, continue on, on treading on this right path even if everyone wants to oppose you and shun you until you might find people who, who unite with you on following this path. Imam al awzai rahimahullah he says, Naduru ma sunnati haythu darat this was the methodology of all of these great Imams of the Salaf. They said that we go and revolve with the Sunnah wherever it leads us. Wherever it leads us. Their methodology was that if a Hadith 
has been established as being authentic, then they would follow it, they would implement it, and they would not oppose it with their personal positions and opinions and statements. They would not wait for any imam to give them approval to follow it or accept it, or they would not leave it for the opinion and statement of other imam. They would go with the sunnah wherever it goes. In this is a refutation of the fanatism fanatism and extremism of following the four mazahib and their imams that we just confine ourselves and restrict ourselves to this particular mazhab and if the hadith and the sunnah is in opposition to this mazhab then we are not allowed to follow this hadith and the sunnah and we are to re reject this hadith and the sunnah the methodology of these great imams was that they would follow the sunnah unconditionally no matter who said in agreement with it no matter who said in disagreement with it. They went with the hadith and the sunnah wherever it led them. From the statements of Imam al-Azai, rahimahullah, he says, وَمَا رَأْيُ مْرَأِينَ فِي أَمْرٍ بَلَغَهُ فِيهِ عَنِ النَّبِيِّ صلى الله عليه وسلم إِلَّا اتِّبَاعُهُ وَلَوْ لَمْ يَكُنْ فِيهِ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَقَالَ فِيهِ أَصْحَابُهُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ كَانُوا أَوْلَى فِيهِ بِالْحَقِّ مِنَّا لِيَنَّ اللَّهَ أَثْنَى عَلَى مَنْ بعدهم باتباعهم إياهم فقال والذين اتبعوهم بإحسان he says that if a person were to listen and hear a hadith of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم if a, if a sunnah and hadith of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم were to reach him he was informed of a hadith of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم then he has no choice but to follow it upon him is to follow it and to follow the understanding of the Sahaba of this hadith. To follow the understanding of the Sahaba of this hadith. For really the Sahaba, the companions of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, they are the force of the Muslims to be upon the truth and upon guidance. And Allah Azza wa Jal has praised those who follow their path. Who follow their path. Understand the Quran and Sunnah by their understanding when he said in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ Allah Ta'ala has praised those people who follow the path of the Salaf in goodness. فَقُلْتُمْ أَنْتُمْ لَا بَلْ نَعْرِضُهَا عَلَى رَأْيِنَا فِي الْكِتَابِ فَمَا وَافَقَهُ مِنْهُ صَدَّقْنَا وَمَا خَالَفَهُ تَرَكْنَا وَتِلْكَ غَايَةُ كُلِّ مُحْدِثٍ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ رَدُّ مَا خَالَفَ رَأْيَهُ مِنَ السُنَّةِ so he says, but we find today, he's talking about his times, we find today people who say no, we will not unconditionally follow the sunnah upon the understanding of the salaf, who Allah Ta'ala has ordered and praised here, that those who follow the sahaba upon goodness. He said there are people who say no, rather we will place the Quran and the sunnah and the text of the Quran and sunnah upon our intellects. We would refer it back to our intellects and our personal opinions and our personal positions. That which agrees to our personal positions and intellects, then we will act upon it. And that which opposes our intellects and our personal positions, then we will refute it and reject it from the Quran and the Sunnah. He says, Tilka ghayatu kulli muhdithin fil Islam. That is the foundation of every innovation in the religion of Islam. Raddu ma khalaf arayuhu min sunnah The foundation of every misguidance and innovation is to reject from the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu from the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that which opposes one's position and opinion and intellect. And from this is refuting and rejecting the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu due to the position and the fatwa and a statement of an imam from the imams. From that is the statement of Imam Al-Awza'i Rahimahullah who lived in the same time period as Imam Abu Hanifa Rahimahullah He lived in the same time period as Imam Abu Hanifa He says مَا نَقَمْنَا عَلَىٰ أَبِي حَنِيفَ أَنَّهُ يَرَىٰ كُلُّنَا يَرَىٰ وَلَكِنْ نَقَمْنَا عَلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ يَجِئُهُ الْحَدِيثَ عَنِ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم فَيُخَالِفُهُ إِلَىٰ غَيْرِهِ He says that really we do not criticize Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah because he makes ishtihad. He derives and extracts rulings from 
the Quran and the Sunnah and other proofs. We do not criticize him for this, that he has an opinion, a position that he has based on his ishtihad. Rather, and he says, because all of the scholars of Islam, all of us, he says, all of the scholars of Islam, they have ishtihad. And they, they derive rulings and extract rulings. But we criticize him because a hadith comes to him, reaches him on the authority of Prophet Muhammad that is established, that is authentic, so he leaves it for that which is other than it. So he leaves it for that which is other than it, from his personal opinion, from his ishtihad and his qiyas and his analogy. And this is something that Imam al awzai is alluding to, this is well known, as we have mentioned before, that in the early times, in the times of these great Imams of the Tabi'een and the Adubar Tabi'een, there were two main methodologies of jurisprudence and deriving rulings of Islam. Two schools of thought. One was the school of thought of the Ahlul Hadith. One of the school of thought of the Ahlul Hadith, who all of these great Imams are, are upon. That they refer back to the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam deriving and extracting rulings from the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad The second school of thought was the school of thought of the Ahlul Rai, the school of thought of the people of analogy and deduction. And the Imam of this school of thought was Imam Abu Hanifa, Rahimullah, in the city of Kufa in Iraq, the Hanafis and his students. They had a totally different methodology in which they would extract rulings of Islam. So instead of referring to the Hadith and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Imam Abu Hanifa, he had Qiyas, analogy. So he would rule upon similar events and occurrences with a ruling that had a common link and denominator. That had a common link and denominator. So Imam al awzai he says that we do not oppose them for making ishtihad and for extracting rulings. All of us make ishtihad. Rather, we oppose, we oppose him upon him and we criticize him for opposing the hadith of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that is authentic established so he leaves it for Qiyas he leaves it for Qiyas and this is well known from the Hanafi Madhab that they give precedence to the Qiyas over a hadith of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to their analogy and deduction they give it precedence over the hadith of Prophet Muhammad <coughs> Alayhi wasallam. Imam al awzai rahimullah, warns from this methodology by saying, إِذَا بَلَغَكَ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ حَدِيثٌ فَإِيَّاكَ أَنْ تَقُولَ بِغَيْرِهِ فَإِنَّهُ كَانَ مُبَلِّغًا عَنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى That if a hadith of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم was to reach you, if you were to get informed of a hadith of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, then beware of opposing it and saying by other than it taking a position that is in opposition to the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu for verily he was the one who relayed the deen of Allah, the religion of Allah and who relayed the revelation to us Muhammad ibn Abdullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Baqiyya ibn al-Walid Rahimullah he says Qala li al-awza'i Ya Aba Muhammad Ma taqulu fi qawmin yubghiduna hadith nabiyyihim he asked his student, Baqi ibn al-Walid, Imam al-Awzai, asked him saying, O oh, oh, Abba Muhammad, his kunya was Abba Muhammad, Abu Muhammad, he says, what do you say regarding a people who despise and hate the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa This was an extremely strange question. Who from the Muslims would despise and hate the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Qala, qultu qawm su. Baqiyya ibn al-Walid, upon hearing this, that there are people who despise and hate the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he said, they are an evil people. They are an evil people. So Imam al awzai he says, Qala, laysa min sahib bid'a tu haddithuhu an Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi khilaf bid'atihi illa abghad al-hadith. That there is not a person from the people of innovation who is upon misguidance and innovation that you narrate to them a hadith of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that is in opposition to his position and his innovation and his uh, opinion except that he hates and despises the hadith of Prophet Muhammad 
Wasallam. He does not leave off that position and opinion and that innovation, rather he despises and starts hating the hadith of Prophet Muhammad We finish off his methodology in fiqh, in jurisprudence and in, in unconditionally following the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad with this great saying and, and the note of Imam al-Zahabi on this great saying it is a, 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 a statement for us to ponder upon and reflect Imam Ishaq ibn Rahuya from the great scholars of hadith of this nation and from the great fuqaha, jurists of this nation he's from the foremost fuqaha he had a madhab, a school of thought that was followed for, for several uh, for a long period of time until it died off and until it ceased to exist he says that إِذَا إِجْتَمَعَ ثَوْرِ وَلَوْزَاعِ وَمَالِكٌ عَلَىٰ أَمْرٍ فَهُوَ السُنَّةِ he says that if Imam Sufyan al thawri and Malik ibn Anas and Imam al awzai these three, if they were to rule regarding a matter of the religion with a, a same, similar, same ruling, with one ruling, then know that it is Sunnah. Then know that it is Sunnah. It is the religion. It is the correct position. So Imam al zahabi this is being said by who? the great scholar of hadith, the great muhaddith and the great jurist Ishaq ibn Rahuya regarding these three great jurists of this ummah who reached the pinnacle in these sciences of Islam from foremost of them the science of hadith and the science of fiqh as we mentioned Imam al awzai had a school of thought that was followed for, for centuries in, in various lands Imam Malik until today there's a school of thought that the people blindly confine themselves to and have fanatism, extremism towards it and follow it. Uh, and same with Sufyan al So when Imam Ishaq ibn Rahuya said that if they were to rule upon a ruling with one ruling, they all agree on a ruling, then it is the Sunnah, it is part of the religion. Imam al Zahabi narrated this statement, then wrote this extremely important note. He says, Bali Sunnah ma sannahu an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wal khulafa al rashidun min ba'di. That rather, this is not the sunnah, this is not the religion. Rather, the sunnah is that which the Prophet said and did. That is the sunnah and what the Khulafa Rashidin, Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali, the, those who followed the Prophet in this actions and in his actions. This is the sunnah, not, this is the religion, not what these three great Imams accepting this high status and their position in the religion but what they have agreed upon this is not the sunnah and religion he continues by saying وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَالَفَ الثَّلَاثَ الْمَذْكُورِينَ مِنْ كِبَارَ الْعِمَّةِ فَلَا يُسَمَّ مُخَالِفًا لِلْإِجْمَاءِ وَلَا لِلْسُنَّةِ He says that the ijma, the consensus of the ummah, which is a proof from the proofs of the Sharia of Islam. The Sharia of Islam, the proofs are the Qur'an, the Book of Allah, the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the ijma of the ummah, the ijma, the consensus of the ummah as the Prophet ﷺ has established an authentic hadith. These are the proofs for the rulings of Islam. So he says the ijma is the ijma of the entire Muslim nation. The scholars of the entire Muslim nation. Not just these three scholars, regardless of the great status and position they had in the religion of Islam. Ijma consensus is what all of the scholars of the ummah of the Muslim nation have agreed upon from past times to present times so from past times to present times as for the for the matter that these three imams imam sufyan al-thawri and awzai and malik they have agreed upon regardless of the status then the one who opposes them then he is not to be deemed someone who has opposed the sunnah of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he has not deemed to be opposed the ijma of the muslims the consensus of the Muslims. So then he said, Wa inna ma murad ishaq in annahum iza ishtama'u ala masala fa huwa haqqu ghaliban. He says, explaining the statement of Ishaq ibn Rahuya, 
rahimullah, that this is not the sunnah, this is not religion, that if someone were to oppose the position of these three imams, then he has opposed the sunnah, that he has opposed the ijma, the consensus. Rather, what Imam Ishaq ibn Rahuya he means is that if these three great foremost scholars of Muslims, if they have agreed on a position, then it is true and correct most of the times. It is true and correct most of the times. It is true and correct most of the time. Then he says, كَمَا نَقُولُ وَالْيَوْمِ لَا يَكَادُ يُوْجَدَ الْحَقْ فِي مَا اتَّفَقَ عَيْمَّةُ الْإِشْتِهَادَ الْأَرْبَعَ عَلَى خِلَافِ مَا اِعْتِرَافِنَا بِيَنَّ اِتْتِفَاقَهُمْ عَلَى مَسَلَّا لَا يَكُونُ إِجْمَا الْأُمَّةِ Then he says, this is exactly as what we say in our times, Imam Al-Zahabi is saying, Rahimahullah, that if the four imams of the four present day madhahib, Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik, and Imam al-Shafi'i and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. If all of them agree on a specific ruling, that the, in this matter, this is a ruling, all four of them agree, then he says that this is more prone to being correct, and this is more uh, prone to being right. This is more prone to being right. However, the one who opposes them, he is not to have said that he has opposed the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad, he is not to say that he has opposed the ijma, the consensus of the entire Muslim nation because there are only four scholars. These are only three scholars, regardless of their high status and position. This shows us the understanding of these great Imams that haq and truth and Islam is not confined to these madhahib, the four madhahib. Regardless of the great status and positions of the Imams of these madhahib, and our respect and honor and reverence to them and our benefit from them but if they have agreed on a matter it does not mean that that is particularly the sunnah and the, prof, uh, the, the religion of Islam and the one who has opposed their position for the hadith of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that he has opposed the sunnah or he has opposed the ijma, the consensus of the Muslims meaning that they are, they are rulings that these four Imams have united upon in which the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad is something different. The, the, the right position is other than that. And they will be rewarded for the ishtihad, for the exertion uh, to reach the truth and their mistake will be forgiven. That right and religion of Islam and Sunnah is not confined just in these four madhahib. Then Imam Al-Zahabi he says to prove that that if Imam Al-Awza'i and Imam Sufyan Authority and Malik gather on a position that it is not the Sunnah, it is not the religion necessarily, and the one who opposes is not to have said he has opposed the Sunnah, he says, وَمِنْ غَرَائِبْ مَنْ فَرَدَ بِهِ الْأَوْزَاعِ أَنَّ الْفَخِذَ لَيْسَ فِي الْحَمَّامِ عَوْرَى وَأَنَّهَا فِي الْمَسْجِدْ عَوْرَى That Imam Al-Awza'i, he had his own methodology, fiqh and mazhab that the that was implemented and followed by people for uh, centuries in many areas. From his positions was that if a man, he uncovers his, his tie in the hammam, meaning the public uh, washrooms and spas, if he uncovers his tie in these public places, then it is not aura. Then it is not aura. But if he uncovers his tie in the masjid, then it is aura. It is uncovers his tie in the masjid, then it is aura. This is one of the positions of this great Imam, Imam Al Awza'i. Then he says, "Wallahu masail kathira hasana yanfaridu biha, wa hiya mawjuda fil kutub al kibar." That he also has other positions similar to this that are specific to him. He is pointing by way of this that these imams they made ishtihad and they are to be rewarded for their exertion and their service. But not every position they had and not every statement and fatwa they rule by is sunnah and is consensus of the Muslims that it, they cannot be opposed. And if someone wants to oppose them, he is to be rebuked by saying he has opposed the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Him or other Imams from Imam Abu Hanifa and Malik and Shafi and Ahmad and other than that. Then he says, Imam al Zahabi concluding his statement, وَكَانَ لَهُ مَذْهَبٌ مُسْتَقِلٌ مَشْهُورٌ that Imam al awzai these positions and his school of thought, his madhab, it was a 
self-standing madhab that was well known and the people in the area of Sham where he resided and the, uh, in Andalus in Spain, present day Spain there were people who followed his madhab they followed his madhab then it died off and it ceased to exist showing that these four madhab that have been left amongst us these are not the only madhab that have ever existed and that religion is just pa uh, what these four madhab have ruled and uh, the positions that they have rather there were many other madhab such as the madhab of Imam al awzai that was followed in Sham that was followed in Spain but then due to political reasons and other factors these madhab ceased to exist and the four madhab were spread by way of political means and others we don't want to go into details but there's a long story and uh, 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 this is well known preserved in the books of history how the Maliki madhab the madhab of Imam Malik it became the madhab of the people of Andalus and the people who live in Spain uh, in that time the Muslims who resided and the areas of North Africa today such as Morocco and Tunisia and Libya and, and Algeria the people of these countries they are upon the Maliki Madhab so there's great uh, historical narration one can find in the books of Hadith how they were upon the Madhab of Imam al awzai and how political factors and how the rulers of those lands forcefully implemented the people upon the Maliki Madhab that led to it being the Madhab of those lands uh, that, that is present amongst our until our days today then we move on to another topic which is his statements the statements of this great Imam so we can reflect and ponder upon them we have we have presented many of them in the in the topic of his creed and his falling of the belief of the Salaf and opposing the people of innovation and misguidance here we'll find some other statements of his such as he says man aksara zikr al maut kafahu al yaseer وَمَنْ عَرَفَ أَنَّ مَنْ تِقَهُ مِنْ عَمَلِهِ قَلَّ كَلَامُ That whoever remembers death frequently and a lot, then he would be sufficient. We're very little in this worldly life because he knows that this worldly life is, is, is extremely short and death can occur and come at any moment without warning. So he will be more focused on the hereafter and he will suffice himself with very little from this worldly life. And the one who realizes that his speech, what he utters with his tongue, it is part of his actions, then he will speak very little. People today, they speak and they talk without considering the words that they are uttering and realizing that these are actions upon which they will be rewarded or punished on the day of judgment. Verily, every one of us has a... Has a has an uh, angel, an angel who is recording every word that we say, every word that we say, and Allah Ta'ala will reward us or punish us on every word that we say. So he says, whoever realizes this, that his speech is part of this action upon whom, which you will be rewarded or punished, then you'll, you will diminish and lessen your speech. You will only speak in that which is good and permissible and knowledge and calling the people towards good worshipping Allah and you will not speak in futile useless matters Imam al awzai rahimahullah he says inna al mu'mina yaqulu qaleelan wa ya'malu kaseeran wa inna al munafiqa yatakallamu kaseeran wa ya'malu qaleelan he says the mu'min the believer his sign he is the one who speaks little but he acts a lot his actions outnumber and outweigh his speech. He speaks little, but he acts a lot. And the opposite is the munafiq, the hypocrite. He speaks a lot. He speaks a lot, but he acts very little. His actions are extremely little, but he speaks a lot. Imam al awzai rahimahullah, he says, Man atala qiyam al-layl, hawwan allahu alayhi wuqufa yawm al qiyama That the one who stands for long periods of time in this worldly life, in his night prayer, in Qiyamul Layl, then his standing on the day of judgment will be easier upon him on, on the day of judgment. His standing in front of Allah Azza wa Jal on the day of judgment will be easier upon him. The one who stands for long periods of time on Qiyamul Layl in his worldly life, then his standing on the day of judgment in front of Allah will be easier upon him. 
Walid ibn Mazyad, rahimullah, he says, Su'il al-awza'i anil khushu'i fi salah. Faqala, ghaddu al-basar, wa khaftu al-jinah, wa lina al-qalb, wa huwa al-huzn wa al-khawf. That he said, Imam al-awza'i was asked regarding khushu'i. Regarding khushu in the prayer, serenity in the prayer. So he answered with a general answer that applies to all acts of worship. He said, to reach peace and tranquility and serenity in your worship, the secret is to lower your gaze. To lower your gaze, not to look at that which is haram. To lower your gaze and to have a soft heart, to not be stern. In, in your heart and this is the foundation of fear of Allah Azza wa Jal Musa al-Ayyan Rahimullah he says Qala li al-awza'i Ya Aba Sa'id Kunna namzah wa nadhaq Fa'amma idha sirna yuqtada bina Ma ara yasa'una illa tabassum That Imam al-Awza'i he said to Musa al-Ayyan One of his students he said that, oh, Abu, Abu Sa'id, Ya Abu Sa'id, he, his kunya was Abu Sa'id, he said, we in the past, when we were just starting off in this path of seeking knowledge, we used to joke around. And we used to laugh hysterically and play around and joke around. But now, when we have become, no, we have attained knowledge and people look to us as leaders, as people who are to be followed, then it is not befitting for us except smiling. Except smiling. The person of knowledge, the student of knowledge, he has to have a, a particular way of conduct that he should conduct himself. He should not be just like the general layman people laughing around, playing around, uh, fooling around. Rather, he should have that which differentiates him, that respects the knowledge that he has and the path he's upon. He should not uh, be uh, like the general people in uh, what he has been blessed with from this knowledge. He should take care and, uh, and uh, conduct himself properly. Imam al-Awza'i, rahimahullah, he says, كَانَ هَذَا الْعِلْمْ كَرِيمًا يَتَلَقَّاهُ الرِّجَالُ بَيْنَهُمْ فَلَمَّا دَخَلَ فِي الْكُتُبِ دَخَلَ فِيهِ غَيْرُ أَهْلِهِ He says that this knowledge, the knowledge of hadith, the knowledge of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu it was a very noble, virtuous knowledge that only the people of virtue and nobility and those who strove and exerted themselves in this, in this, uh, in this path would attain this knowledge. <coughs> in their lifetimes, in their eras, it was necessary for a student of hadith to exert and sacrifice everything in the path of this hadith as we have mentioned great stories of the previous Imams. It was not possible except that you travel long distances, bearing the hardest of circumstances, to hear a single hadith or a few hadith from one of the scholars of hadith and to preserve it, safeguard it, memorize it, revise it. But he said, when the books in the end of his life, when writing and compiling the hadith became uh, more towards written forms and it changed from oral and memorization of the heart to to being written, he said, those people who are not proficient in this field, they have entered this field. They have entered this field. Because the books have allowed people who are not at that level of memorization and accuracy and precision to enter into this field. Because now hadith have started to be written. Imam al-Zahabi, after he narrated the statement, he, he wrote a note in his great book, Seer, he says, وَلَا رَيْبَ أَنَّ الْأَخْذَ مِنَ الصُّحُفِ وَالْإِجَازَ يَقْعُ فِيهِ خَلَلٌ وَلَا سِيَمَا فِي ذَلِكَ الْعَسَرِ حَيْثَ لَمْ يَكُنْ بَعْدْ نَقْطٌ وَلَا شَكْلٌ فَتَتَصَحَّفَ الْكَلِمَةَ بِمَا يُحِيلَ الْمَعْنَى وَلَا يَقْعُ مِثْلُ ذَلِكَ فِي الْأَخْذِ مِنْ أَفْوَائِ الرِّجَالِ That he says that without a doubt, the person who seeks knowledge from books without referring to a scholar without sitting with the scholars, without learning from his, their mouths, the person who seeks knowledge through books, then his mistakes will be greater. His mistakes and errors will be greater. Today, one grabs a, a book and he starts reading. He does not know how to pronounce the word. He does not know uh, how to uh, grammatically 
what is the position of this word. He does not understand the meanings of those words. So he understands it and reads it and memorizes it according to his, his understanding. His understanding. So his errors would be great. Imam al Zahabi he says that especially in the times of the Salaf, because writing in that time still was not developed to a point that it had dots and, punct and punctuation marks, the Fatha and the Kasra and the Dhamma. They used to write many times without these dots and without these marks. So the person who reads from books and studies, he does not know uh, what these words are and what, what, what it should be. For example, he says that they would make these errors of Tashif. Tashif is an error in which the, the writing of the, of the letters is the same but the word changes due to the dots or the punctuation, the fatha, dhamma or kasra. For example, Abbas and Ayyash. Abbas and Ayyash write it the same way. Ayn, then a kursi, alif and but the difference is by the dots. In Abbas you have a dot at the bottom, ba, in Ayyash you have two dots. In the sheen there's no dots for Abbas but in the sheen for Ayyash you have three dots on the top. So they used to write in old times mostly without these dots and without this fatha dhamma kasa, these punctuation marks. So a person who's, who does not seek the knowledge from the mouths of the scholars, he does not know if this is Abbas or if this is Ayyash. So he will re read it, memorize it, understand it according to his memory and he'll make mistakes. According to his understanding and he will make mistakes. So he says, وَلَا يَقَعُ مِثْلَ ذَلِكْ مِنَ الْأَخْذْ مِنَ أَفَائِرْ رِجَالِ that does not occur when a student of knowledge attends the gatherings of the scholars and hears from their mouths. Hear from their mouths, those who are proficient in this science. With this, we have reached the end of the biography of this Imam. We finish with the, with the heading of his death, Rahimullah. He passed away in the month of Safar, in the second month of the Hijri calendar, in the month of Safar, in the year 157. 157 after the Hijrah of Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Mushir rahimullah he says, Balagana mawtu lawza'i wa anna mra'atahu aghlaqat alayhi bab al-hammam ghair muta'amida fa mata fa amaraha Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz bi itq raqabah wa lam yukhallif siwa sitta dananir. He says that it was narrated to us that Imam al-awza'i rahimullah the cause of his death was that he entered the hammam. The Hammam, a place, a spa, or uh, a, a place to take a wash and uh, where there's uh, smoke, etc., uh, for that is present in spas. So he said I, he entered that place. So his wife, she locked the door and she forgot to unlock it. So she forgot to unlock it and he passed away in, in this place. So Saeed bin Abdul Aziz, who was the governor, ruler of that time at the area, out of his love and respect and honor for Imam al awzai he ordered his wife, who had committed this error and mistake, to free a slave as expiation for her action. And he says that, Walam yukhallif siwa sitta dananir. When he passed away, he had not left as inheritance except six, six dinars. Six dinars. Only six dinars was his entire uh, inheritance that he left behind showing that these Imams devoted and exerted and sacrificed uh, everything in the path of learning and preserving and conveying, relaying the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Muhammad ibn Ubaid al-Tanafisi rahimahullah he says Kuntu in the Sufyan al-Thawri Fajaahu rajulun Faqala ra'aytu ka'anna raihanatan min al-maghribi rufi'at that he said that I was with Imam Sufyan al thawri Sufyan al thawri in Iraq. And he said that a person came to Imam Sufyan al thawri with a dream that he just had, asking him explanation of this dream, asking him the explanation of his dream. So he said that I saw in my dream as if a star has just risen from the Maghrib. Because Iraq, the west of it is a sham. Iraq is in the east and to the west of it is Sham, the area of Sham. So he said, I saw in my dream as if a star has risen from the west. So Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, he says, Rahimahullah, In sadaqta 
In sadaqat ruyak faqad mata al awza'i that if your dream is true, if you're truthful in your dream, then this means that Imam al awzai rahimahullah has passed away. This means that Imam al awzai has passed away. فَكَتَبُوا ذَلِكْ فَوُجِدَ كَذَلِكَ فِي ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمِ So they wrote a message, a letter to the scholars of Sham asking him, asking them if Imam al awzai is alive, what has happened? So they found out that he passed away on the same day. He passed away in the same day that, that this person said he saw this dream. He saw this dream. May Allah have mercy on this great Imam, Imam al awzai and the Imams uh, before him who have, who are the shining lights of this nation, the foremost scholars of the Salaf uh, who have preserved the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the reason that the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has reached us today unaltered without any addition and subtraction due to the great efforts and them exerting themselves in this field. Wallahu ta'ala alam wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. If anyone has any questions then we'll take them. Yeah, their mazhab being followed, meaning that that which is not in the Quran and the Sunnah and the Ijma, in the proofs of Islam, those matters, the people will refer back to these scholars and his ishtihad, his position would be followed in this. His position would be followed in this as Allah Ta'ala has ordered the people who are not of knowledge to refer back to the scholars in these matters by saying, Fas'alu ahl dhikri in kuntum la ta'alamun. That refer back to the scholars if you do not know. If you do not know. So this is what that means. It does not mean that they used to use or he had positions and fatawa and opinions that opposed the Quran and the Sunnah and the Ijma or the Muslims would use his positions to oppose the Quran and the Sunnah and the Ijma or they would blindly follow his, all his fatawa and positions and confine themselves to them and loving and hating based on that and uh, restricting the following of other scholars' opinions or positions. This is what that means. No. When you were talking about how if someone had disagreed with some of the scholars, including the four, if there's yeah. a consensus upon the four that what are the requirements for a fatwa or a dalil or something to be considered ijma? There's a consensus. Like how many scholars or what are the I mean, this is, a, this is a very difficult issue of establishing ijma. And the scholars have spoken about this uh, before us from the scholars of the Salaf, such as Imam Ahmad and other than them, that to establish that this ijma on a particular issue that all of the scholars of Islam have agreed then it is a very tedious task and it is very difficult. So in this, we rely upon what the scholars have informed us. Their knowledge of these matters and them relaying to us that there's ijma on these matters, then we accept that from them. So there are books, the scholars of the Salaf, they have written books in which they have compiled the matters upon which there's a ijma. There's a consensus of the Muslims from the times of the Salaf, the Sahaba, and the Tabi'een, and the, those who came after them. From the foremost of these books is the great book of Imam Ibn al-Munzir. Imam Ibn al-Munzir, he has a book, Al-Ijma, which is well known, published. He passed away in the early 300s, in the early 300s, in the 4th century, the beginning of the 4th century Hijri. So he has a book, Al-Ijma, in which he has collected the matters that the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and the Atba'u Tabi'een have agreed upon and unanimously and they, they found no disagreement and no one opposing them in that, in that uh, uh, consensus, in that consensus. And uh, as Imam Zahabi mentioned in his statement and we do not want to go into detail, uh, this is detailed issues, but the Ijma is of two types. The ijma consensus is of two types mainly. The first type is that they have ruled upon something and they have unified and agreed upon this matter. The second is al-ijma sukuti, where 
there's no opposition that has come in a matter. No opposition that has come in a matter, that none of them are opposed a matter. So this is a silent ijma, meaning that they're silent, it's a proof that they have agreed and united on this matter. So the, these are detailed topics, but as I mentioned, that is very uh, difficult to uh, uh, establish ijma that the ummah has all of the scholars from the first to the last to present times have agreed on a matter. No. Yeah. I mean, ijma, ijma, it is something that follows the, the two main sources of Islam, which is the Quran and the Sunnah. Ijma is something that comes after it, additional, because the Prophet ﷺ in the Sunnah has directed the Muslims to it. That my ummah, the Muslims will not unite upon misguidance. In authentic hadith, that they will not unite upon misguidance. So this is something that comes after the Quran and the Sunnah. The, the foremost and the, the original sources of Islam are the Quran and the Sunnah, the Kitab and the Sunnah, the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jazakumullahu khairan. وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَى تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنْسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ